Servus and hello there, my name is Andrew, I'm from the Shieldery and the first time I crafted the shield we're gonna make today was actually for myself. But little did I knew that it should become my best selling replica out of the, well, over 200 shields I made till today. I'm of course talking about the beautiful Shongawa Pavese. It was made between the years 1450 and 1500. Just look at it. I think it's so beautiful. The shield got examined in detail in a laboratory and they detected linden wood. I'll go with Sprouse though because, well, it saves me and the customer like 80 bucks and is also authentic for this type of shield. And I told that to every customer and they all went with Sprouse. But because I have to make the shield five times this time, I decided to make an additional sixth piece out of elder wood, which is a bit more common for Parisians of that size and has been used for most types of shields in the whole middle ages. Its workability and general behavior is also way closer to linden wood than Sprouse, by the way. Wait. After sewing out the central plank's shape, we can start to set the glue and surface to an angle. We don't need to be that exactly when it comes to the degree though. I just mark the distances to where I want to plane and there I go. It's always satisfying to see the electric planer do its thing here. <laughs> This edge would point into the shield's center, so we'll have to cut and round it off, which is way easier to do before gluing it in place. The centerboard has a slight trapezoid cross-section, also way easier to accomplish before the assembly. Before we can start to glue those bots together, we gotta face a serious problem, which nearly ruined my first try of making a pavisi, which is on how to keep the boards together at that angle. Some of you maybe think you could just use a screw clamp, but of course, ah, it is way too short, so we could only place it in like that distance and that's it and we surely need something to put a pressure on it in the middle even if those were long enough like boat builders clamps for example you'd have the problem it would automatically slide off because we got the different angles here now you maybe think we could have let this straight but we'd still have the problem though because of the angle here those are not parallel and therefore we can't press them together with force like this now it took me some time to find a solution for that but it's actually this a screw without a thread here on the top. Now when we drill the screw inside, it will push the two boards together. Uh, you could call it a screw clamp, but without the clampy thing and just the screw. <laughs> and I'm really proud of that method. Of course, I could think about some authentic methods in which you could maybe do that. Those would be quite difficult to apply when you need to make like five pieces at once. In addition, this video is not about how to make it with only the authentic techniques, but on how to make it with the authentic materials. Talking about the materials, let's take a look at the glue. We'll use the so-called casein or cheese glue. I already let the casein sit with two and a half times its weight overnight with water. And now it's time to activate it by adding two thirds of the casein's weight in pit lime. Now we've got like 10 to 15 minutes to work with it, so we're in a bit of a hurry. For the originals also dowels got used, so let's implement them now. Those are just the standard 10 mm ones. As you can see, the screw left quite a bad hole, but I got a trick for that. Let's just add a bit of water because now the fibers soak in the water again and this reduces like the deformation by a lot. Don't forget to take the perspective into account when you copy the shield's shape. Now it's time to refine the shape. As you can see, the boards are already bent a bit. This is because of the natural drying process, but sometimes this gets redone when we apply the rawhide and linen fabric later. So we're gonna go for sure, but well, not that much. I think four millimeters on the right spots should be enough. In addition, the original boards were quite thick, something like 1.5, 1.9 centimeters. And we're already at 1.9 here. So I think four millimeters are still adequate. The first tool we'll use is the electric planer, and then we'll switch to the edge grinder again, followed by the orbital sander. You maybe ask yourself, well Andrew, why don't you do this by hand? Well, I could do it by hand and it would look basically the same at the end. This would make it more expensive. Well, as I said, it just looks the same in the end. So why should I do that? I'm still going to show it exemplary for those of you who are interested. In the end, it's just really a lot of planning though. <laughs> Thank you. 
I decided to add the music's title while you can hear it in this video. I don't have to do so now because I got a subscription from Soundstripe which gives me the licenses. I added the information anyway though because I feel like I should pay off the artists who composed them in at least one video. I also linked the channel of Cody Martin from which like 80% of the tunes in this video are from. You can find him in the video's description. We're nearly finished with the wooden core now. We only need to treat it with the orbital sander for which I well only need ear protection. Thank God! In the medieval ages they probably would have continued to treat it with different kinds of planners and just decrease the amount they shave off. Now we are at the meat of the project which is the shield's covering because the Shongawa Pavases went only covered in uh, rawhide or linen fabric but in both. Rawhide on the back, linen fabric on the front and an additional problem here is that the rawhide on the back actually wasn't covered in base coat. That means if we leave like a little bubble or something like that it will be visible till forever. For gluing the pieces together we're gonna use side glue which I let sit overnight behind me with 1 to 4, 1 to 5 water. Now we're gonna put it in a water bath, heat that up to 50 to 60 degrees and let it sit for a couple of minutes. Then we're gonna apply a first layer which will like bind this whole piece together because we still got like small holes left in the wood knots and stuff like that a bit around the dowels too when we apply the base layer of hide glue it will basically correct that while this first layer dries i'm gonna cut out the rawhide and the linen fabric Oh boy, that cow half has gone quickly. Linen fabric shrinks when it gets wet. In order to avoid too strong deformations, I quickly pushed it into the water, put it aside again and let it hang even for like three minutes. We want it wet, not soaked. After making sure that the position is correct, we can turn it over again and glue it in four steps in total. It will still shrink a tiny amount, so let's make sure that it won't stretch out of the crevice, which would create an ugly air bubble. Rawhide on the other hand expands when it gets wet and shrinks while drying. That's why we only want to put it in water as short as possible. But cause the thickness of natural product varies, we'll just keep that part longer in the water. Make sure to glue the flesh side of the rawhide to the shield, which is the rougher one. Otherwise the procedure is pretty similar, but with a higher danger of air bubbles because it can't escape through the weaving this time. Flipping the edge takes by far the most endurance. In general, you just massage the pieces to the surface, but that takes some time. You definitely need a good pair of scissors for the job, especially in the overlaps by the crevices, you'll have to cut out some triangles, cause they just won't stay in place at that part. This is so much easier when the rawhide is thin. <laughs> it should have like half a millimeter, then you won't have any problems. At the end, we just remove the excess hide glue, we smear it on the back with a normal kitchen sponge. After the third pavisi, I took another look at the originals and noticed that they actually didn't just cut stripes, but cut out triangles instead. So let's try that with this one. Just from a first impression, I'd say it's twice the amount of cuts you have to make. Yeah, well, maybe that pays off at the end. <laughs> Let's see whether that makes a difference. In the corner, it's definitely very good. Doesn't make that much of a difference, I'd say. The only problem I got more with these is in those corners we got now. Because air is getting sucked into it all the time. Just from the optics, what do you think? Yeah, okay, but can you see how it's coming up here again? Maybe we can massage that off. Okay, that worked. You know what? I'm gonna continue like that. Not because it's that much of a difference work-wise, but for the sake of authenticity. <laughs> this is the last Chongawa Pavese I got a cover for this stock and I just discovered something awesome. I can just cut it 
when it's still lying on the front. And now for like the triangles, I just got a cut to the point shortly before the fabric ends. This would have saved me so much frustration and like stress because time and the clamps and stuff like that if I would have known it sooner. And you and maybe my future me <laughs> is very thankful that I can share that with the internet now. And I want to give just a gigantic shout out to my Patreons. Your support means so much to me. I really mean it. Thanks a lot. If you want to join them, the link is in the description. And otherwise, maybe give a sacrifice to the algorithm and boop the like button. I'm gonna finish that off now. Ah, <laughs> oh, just look at that. So beautiful. They basically didn't deform at all. Now it's time to apply the fittings. The cramps will use the hand forged by Einas Schmiede. But additionally, we'll have to work with ox tendons for the middle grip. I always hate to work with them. You know, first we gotta soak them for two days because they are so thick. Then it just stinks extremely bad and you can't wash it off. But let's apply the cramps first. Ah, disgusting. We also got remainings of the meat here. We're gonna pull that off. Okay, I think this is the bottom point here where it doesn't make sense anymore. And now we're just gonna slice the top. Yeah, well, maybe a bit wider. And there we are. I think I can make it a bit shorter. Vah. They are mainly sold for dogs to play with, by the way. We also gently want to tap the point where we want to put the nails through later. Now we want to place that in a position where the hand of the owner will be close to the center of gravity. But it's basically something you have to guess every time. <laughs> also don't forget that you need a bit of air under here because it'll shrink when it dries. In order to keep it in the position we'd like it to have while it dries, we'll just put a scrap piece of wood and we'll put it in the position we like. Looking at it now, I think I should have placed it like a bit higher, but well, the authentic ones weren't all equally placed too, so. It's okay. Ah, oh, this one looks so beautiful. I'm so happy that you can still see the wood texture. Before we can finally start to paint now, we gotta take care of the base coat, as it was written in the museum's analysis. For that, we'll use our height glue again, but this time mix one to nine, one to 10 with water, and then we'll add the same amount of chalk. I think I'll go with chalk of the champagne. The water bath never should get warmer than 60 degrees Celsius, because over that, all the beautiful long gluten molecules start to break down, then it well wouldn't glue that good anymore. And in addition, small bubbles start to rise, which well would cause bubbles in the base coat, which are quite bad to paint on. Maybe you think now, well, Andrew, how did they measure the temperature back then? Uh, didn't you want to show how it could be done with authentic tools? I think the trick they used back then is to see when little tiny bubbles start to rise, because that's what happens at 60 degrees. Now, when they saw those little bubbles rise, they most likely put it away from the fire and added a bit of water and then just let the water bath warm the glue up. You see that huge glue stain here we left? We gotta cut that off because we just couldn't cover that up with the base coat and it's way easier to remove it that way. Don't tell me that's bad to make that with a box cutter's knife because it's basically the best thing you can do when you gotta work on such a bent surface. Because you can see how close I can get to the surface with the box cutter's knife by also bending it. Yeah, see that? It's like perfectly on the same level. You don't necessarily need a scale in order to determine how much chalk you need. You just have to wait until little islands form and there you go. The first layer of base coat has just dried and before we add the second one, we should look out whether we see those small spots of glue and then cut them off because they are that kind of surface irritation from which the paint could get scratched off pretty quickly. And also it wouldn't look that good. <laughs> we got a bit of cleanup to do on the edges before we can finally start to paint now. We've got some ugly drops on the edge and some not very even rims of the different layers of base coating. We'll get rid of that by first scratching it off with the back of the box cutter's knife 
and then cleaning those last remainings up by just going over it with a normal sponge. In order to get the motive and the size I'd like it to have, I used the free tool post razor, which is linked in the video's description. We gotta transfer it to the shield though now, facing two problems. The first one is perspective, because when I like put it in place in the middle and then copy it and want to continue outwards, I would leave a huge gap at the edge. That's why we're gonna copy the middle first, then put it a bit to the side and copy the sides. It's always a bit difficult to match that then, so I'm just gonna leave it blank. The second problem is of the actual copying. For that, we're gonna use carbon copy paper because if you put it down and then like scratch it a bit it will transfer. Fun fact <laughs> if you wanted to write the same letter to two people in the past you just put that between another piece of paper and then wrote it. Today if you want to write the same email to more than one person you set them CC. The CC is short for carbon copy paper. Let's transfer the motive now. The Bavarian rhombuses in the middle always trigger me because the lines are not parallel. I tried to make it with like parallel lines but it looked kind of bad. It actually looked better with those lines, then making it geometrically accurate. <laughs> if you want to copy from one page multiple times, those ball pen thingies are actually better than a pen because it won't scratch through the paper that much. You also should keep in mind where the CC stops in order to not paint abroad and then basically have to redo it. <laughs> the problem you will have with carbon copy paper though is that you can't erase it with, well, an eraser. But there's another method. I totally slipped here. Now. We just grab our sponge again and can redraw it and fill in the spots with the potential overlap we left before. It's quite important to don't leave any marks outside the Angry Bird because the color we'll apply there is slightly transparent. Of course, we're going to use oil paint as the originals, which is actually quite easy to make. I'm going to use linseed oil varnish. I know the varnish isn't authentic, but it only differs in 3% of the originals in ingredients and it dries in three days and not three weeks. This timing is very important because when you make your own paint with the mostly original pigments, they tend to run into each other. That means I'm gonna have to paint it in three passes which have to dry in between in as I said two or three days. We'll start with the background and Italian gold ochre. And yes I know some pigments won't be the originals. I'm gonna use Titan white instead of lead white for example because the original is highly toxic and in this case I can't even buy it in Germany at the moment. The other one I'm gonna replace is the cinnabar red. It's also toxic but you can mix it and nobody will see the difference. And now have fun watching the final montage as we say in Germany and I think that's beautiful. Or so he thought the blue-eyed cheeky wanker. Another thing that makes the Shongawa Pavesas very interesting is that we've got like eight different pieces of them. On those you can see how much it was allowed for a motive to differ from piece to piece while staying in the same style and depicting the same coat of arms and motive. Yes, that's where we want to go. As you can see, it's a bit lighter than the original ones, but the original ones has, yeah, well, aged. And in addition, ours will be a bit darker after it dries and after we'll apply the varnish, which means we hit the mark. Ooh, I had a very good idea and improvised something to sit on. Just an old ponal barrel and a piece of wood on top of it and oh, it feels so much better. <laughs> As awesome as the azurite blue will be, which we use for the rhombuses in the heart shield, it has one weakness, which is it's not that covering. That means we gotta prime it first before we can actually apply it. I didn't calculate that in with the three like turns, but uh, let's see, maybe it'll work. Otherwise, we'll just need to wait like three days more.
for the black color, I used a one-to-one mixture of wine black and bone black. I'm always quite nervous when it comes to the last step, because potentially I could ruin a lot. But the key is not to think about that, turn on some nice music again and, well, enjoy the outcome. I got two problems now. The first one's a bit annoying, but not that bad. I just painted myself into a corner here. You see everywhere around I already painted, but not this part. So I really have to be careful where to place my hand um, or my pinky because otherwise I could like smear the paint everywhere. The second problem is worse though, because the paint kind of starts to bleed, as I call it. You see that? Kind of fuzzies out here also on the neck. Ah. As you can see, it just flows out. Maybe that's because I didn't add enough pigments. I'm gonna correct that for the next eagle. Down there, it's okay, you know, on some parts, like here, up here, no problem. But then, strange, very strange. After thinking about the reason why it's bleeding like this for a bit, I got a solid theory, I think. As you can see, it occurs mostly with the golden ochre background. That's because it's very dry and it wants to drink up the oil and drags a bit of the pigments with it. The reason why I think that is because it doesn't happen with the red nose and with the blue rhombuses, because they are all quite thick and if you look at it from an angle, you can see that they reflect quite oilish. What I should have done, or at least that's my theory for the next time, Listen closely, future Andrew. To just apply a clear layer of linseed oil varnish on top in order for the drier layers to soak that in. In order for them to not have to do that with future paint that gets applied. But that doesn't help me with the problem right now after applying the paint. So yeah, well, I guess I gotta learn from that. <laughs> I'm gonna correct the problems we had with the edges before just with a q-tip and pure alcohol. Just rub it off very gently. I think that should do the trick. Thanks for watching that long. I'm sure you'll also like this video. See you there. Bye bye.